During this Easter season of the year, we Christians celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate that because of the forgiveness that Jesus made possible and the hope that it provides for our future. That forgiveness and the events of Easter are at the core of what it means to be a Christian. And in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder is going to lead the group in a study we're calling Forgiveness, the story of Easter. So there's a primacy to this. This is the core of what we call the gospel, the Mm -hmm. good news of Jesus' work on our behalf. And it's such good news that Paul says this is the most important thing. Now, it seems like an almost rhetorical question because it's so obvious, but what makes this of first importance? Well, that's what our study in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast will explore. Forgiveness, the story of Easter. And welcome to another hour of studying the Bible together on Discover the Word. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And in our next two podcasts, we want our studies to add to your observance of Easter this year and help you reflect on the events and the reasons behind those events that we as Christians are celebrating. And so in this episode, we're going to be focusing on something that is at the center of the Jesus story, forgiveness. And as I mentioned, Bill Crowder is going to be leading and at the table with him will be Marty Hahn and Elisa Morgan and Rasul Berry. And as we join them to get this started, they're talking about how strange it is that even things like forgiveness can foster areas of disagreement among Christians. I think it'd be safe to say that when you think of the church on a global scale, we don't tend to agree on everything, do we? Uh, (laughs) What are some of the things we struggle with Mm. in the family of faith? How to do baptism, Mm -hmm. when to do baptism, Mm -hmm. why to do baptism. Why to do baptism. (laughs) And then there's the end game, you know, the scenario of the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who has what gifts and where they can be used? Yeah, interestingly, arguably the most important thing about the church is the work of Jesus on the cross to give us forgiveness of sins, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we've even found ways to disagree about that. (laughs) Um, Because even though the Bible is very straightforward in that Christ's death and resurrection provides for us forgiveness of sins and relationship with God, the Bible's a lot more obscure about how that works. Mm. And that's where we find ways to disagree with each other. It's called atonement theory. And the last time I checked, there were like 15 different atonement theories as to how it works that because Christ died and rose again, I can be a child of God. So are you going to give us the right one? Well, <laughs> uh, in another era of my life, I might have even <laughs> said something like that. We'll talk about all of them, but I'm going to tell you the right one. Mm-hmm. You know? No, actually, what I want us to do is try to avoid getting into the weeds of the mechanical parts of it and just celebrate together as we move toward Holy Week and the remembrance of Jesus's death and resurrection, the fact that he died and the fact that he rose again and the fact that he did it for us and that it makes an eternal difference in our lives. I'd like for us to focus on the facts we know rather than getting into the weeds of the stuff we don't have full knowledge about. So are you saying the explanations are not important? I'm saying the explanations are not totally available. Okay. I think they're very important. But God in his wisdom has chosen not to provide us with that information. Could we consider positive points from various explanations and how they might work together? We might do that along the way as as we look at different texts because all of those 15 atonement theories are rooted in Scripture to some degree or another. Okay. The problem comes with how we choose to interpret Scripture and how we choose to apply it and different groups, denominations, traditions view all those things differently. And so they see a verse as saying something that maybe you or I would look at that verse and say, I'm not sure that's exactly what that means. Okay. So you don't want us to become exclusive or to to become exclusionary in... No, what I want us to do is celebrate a phrase that we've talked about a lot here, the things that matter most. Mm -hmm. Okay. The things that matter most are Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection 
how God chose to apply that, I'm going to leave that in his wise hands. But we're going to start with a text. Each of you has a different translation, so I'd like to hear it in each of the translations that you have. So it's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And before you read, would you give us what translation you're reading from? Okay, I'll start. I have the NIV. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay, Russell? I got the English Standard Version. For I delivered to you of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Okay, Mark? Okay, and I've got the New Living Translation. It says, Paul writes, I passed on to you what was most important, and what had been also passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. So each one of those translations has the word important. Mm -hmm. So there's a primacy to this. This is the core of what we call the gospel, the Mm -hmm. good news of Jesus' work on our behalf. And it's such good news that Paul says, this is the most important thing. Now, you know, we talked briefly about some of the things we find to disagree on. It seems to me that if we can agree on the most important thing, we can still walk together even while we disagree on some of the lesser important Mm -hmm. things. That's great. Well said. So this is of first importance, and it seems like an almost rhetorical question because it's so obvious, but What makes this of first importance? I've read a lot about atonement in terms of its importance, and and it gets real heady, and so I get kind of lost in it. But bottom line, if Jesus didn't come, die on a cross, be actually buried so that his death is proven and rise again, then his payment on the cross is like null and void. And when I hear people attack the Christian faith, they might attack that belief more than Mm -hmm. anything else. And I'm struck by, I don't want to derail you, but I'm struck by how Paul says in verse three, what I received, I pass on to you. And there were a lot of different ways of expressing that. And I go back to Saul on the road to Damascus and having this amazing, miraculous interaction with the risen Christ. And I wonder, you know, did this understanding come from Jesus' own lips or how else? Yeah, I think about the stakes that Paul raises in this chapter a few verses down where he says in verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, Mm. then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain Mm -hmm. and your faith is in vain. I don't recall him saying that about anything else. He's saying this is the absolute Mm -hmm. core, significant, important piece of our faith. Yeah. Yeah. And there are other texts that talk about receiving Jesus and and it goes on to explain even believing in his name uh-huh. Well, his name is Lord and Savior, mm. you know, so it can be general, inclusive of this one who showed his ability to overcome our sin, to bear our sin, and then to rise from the dead to show that. It- you know, I'm struck by the word crux, the crux of the thing, C-R-U-X, you know, that's the root of crucifixion. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's the core yeah. Of it all. So even in our like vernacular mm-hmm. in our culture, they mm-hmm. picked up yeah. on the fact that the cross is mm-hmm. the crux, it's the yeah. thing, mm-hmm. it's the most important. Thing. Yeah, and in a similar vein, Elisa, when we talk about somebody who's going through a real suffering experience, mm. they, we say it's excruciating. Oh, that's mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. And C R U C I comes from crucifixion mm-hmm. ah. in excruciating. Mm-hmm. So the worst thing we could imagine going through that is described in terms of the cross Mm. as excruciating. It's really Mm. interesting. Mm. When we think about this, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, where do you think Paul's getting that from? Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the easy one, by the way. Mm -hmm. Raised the third day according to the scriptures. That's that's a little bit harder to nail down. Mm. The the scriptures are the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Where do you think he might be getting that? Well, I think about the first Mm. thing that John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and go all the way back to Passover where this institution of this feast, this observance of the fact that the angel of death would pass, that by putting the blood of the Lamb over their doorposts, Mm -hmm. that it would rescue them from death Mm -hmm. and that 
in Leviticus when you see the bestowal of the law and it involved the Day of Atonement, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Yom Kippur, this regular observance of the sacrifice of a lamb for the sins of the people and that Mm -hmm. that was an essential part of being part of the community. All those things are breadcrumbs and the foretaste, the the preview Mm -hmm. of of what what's to come with Jesus. Yeah. And so I think of that as according to the scriptures. Yeah. yeah, and in the middle of that, you've got Isaiah, who sort of brings that word picture forward to yeah. the lamb. Isaiah 53. Who, yeah. mm-hmm. And you could put Psalm 22 in there, mm-hmm. David's prayer that begins with words, Jesus appropriated on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, I think we can find a lot of that. But where do you think the he rose again the third day according to the scriptures? Where do you think that came from? <laughs> well, if I can just borrow Jesus for a second. I mean, he does look at Jonah there you go. Mm-hmm. as saying, hey, just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale mm-hmm. for three days, that the Son of Man will also raise for three days. But there are all, these are also some other mm-hmm. allusions to yeah. like something happening in three days yeah. and death mm-hmm. to life in, in the mm-hmm. Old Testament. As but well. you're right. Jesus himself makes that one connection. Yeah. yeah. And that's the clearest because of the three days, the three days in both places. Mm-hmm. I just think it's really important. Not only do we understand that Paul declares this is of first importance, but he's rooting that not only in his own personal experience with Jesus, but also in the Old Testament scriptures and their preparation for the coming of Jesus. And so that there's basis for this. It's not just him spinning this out of his imagination. Mm -hmm. There's roots to this story that go all the way back to Genesis 3 with what's called the proto-evangelist, where the seed of the woman Mm -hmm. will defeat the serpent. And that's the very first promise of a rescuer who would come. Yeah, and the real defeat is the resurrection, isn't it? That's right. When he overcomes these sins born by him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He died for our sins. He rose to give us life. Mm. Both of those come together beautifully in the message of the gospel as it offers us forgiveness of sins. Yeah, how forgiveness is the story of Easter is what we'll be exploring together in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast. As at this time of year, we remember and celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus and focus on the incredible offer of forgiveness that made possible. Uh, You know, a lot of relationships are all about what's in it for me. What do I get out of this? And what do I have to do for you so that you're obligated to give something back to me? But while that is how many relationships work, the gospel is not like that, even though it can be tough not to think that way about it. And so in this next part of the conversation, we're going to find out why something Bill calls the great transfer can help us wrap our minds around the forgiveness that is the Easter story. What is a transactional relationship? (laughs) This for that. Yeah. Yeah. This for that. You pay something to get something. You do something to get something. I think of the relationship I have with the FedEx delivery person (laughs) or like, you know, just getting a package. If that person started to have a conversation, I'd be like, okay, this has just gotten weird. Like, I just, you know, (laughs) (laughs) give me the box. Or Uber Eats. Or or DoorDash. Just give me my food. Exactly. (laughs) Especially with the food. I mean, the the box can wait, but give me the food right now. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Does that kind of transactional thing, describe our relationship with God. Sometimes I've thought a lot and have used this illustration a lot about viewing God as a vending machine. This is like I put in my 10 bucks or so, you know, I put in, well, wait for 10 seconds and then I start punching buttons. And where's the results? You know, where's what I wanted back? Mm -hmm. And I can, unfortunately, slip into that. We can do it even with wonderful truths like, okay, I give you faith, you give me life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know the right answer to that question is no, it does not describe our relationship (laughs) with God. But I know in my heart, it's been exposed that I've felt that way type of contractual obligation Mm -hmm. when my expectations were not met by God and how I then responded. It can sneak up on you. Sometimes I find myself saying, without even thinking, well, I need to do this because I don't want to forfeit that. Oh, interesting. You know, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I begin, now wait a minute, what am Mm -hmm. I saying? That Mm -hmm. if I do this, you know. I'm going to get something from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was a very young follower of Christ, I was given a book entitled Prayer asking and receiving. 
And I was so glad that a few years later, somebody gave me a different book that let me know that prayer was a whole lot more <laughs> than, than just that kind of transactional yeah. thing with God where I ask and somehow I feel like he has some obligation yeah. to give me whatever I want just because I asked for it. Part of the challenge, like you said, Mark, with a faith-based relationship with God is that it can almost be caricatured if you will, as a transactional relationship, because I give God faith and he gives me forgiveness and eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good deal. Mm -hmm. I just got a good deal. That's a good transaction. I'd like for us to think about this idea of transaction, but I I don't want to think of it in terms of transaction. I want to use the word transfer, Mm -hmm. partly because it's not transaction and partly because I think that's a better word to describe the text involved. And this gets marked to what we talked about in the first conversation about trying to sort out how it is that because Christ died and rose again, I'm forgiven and have eternal life. How Mm -hmm. does that work? Well, Mm -hmm. the closest thing I've found in the scriptures to describing the process is 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I'd like for us, as we did in our last conversation, to read it in a variety of translations so we can hear it in different ways. Alicia, you want to start us off? Okay, and I've got the NIV. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. This one from the the New Living Translation is a little bit different. It says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, Mm -hmm. Oh, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and that's really interesting because as we get into this, one of the things you talked about, Rasul, in our first conversation is Jesus was described by John the baptizer as the Lamb of God who takes Mm -hmm. away the sins of the world, and that goes back as a product of the Jewish sacrificial system and the imagery that was there and all those different things. Here we see that imagery again. He was made an offering for Mm -hmm. sin. This is really interesting because this could be seen by some as transactional in the fact that we give Jesus our sin and he gives us life in God. Mm -hmm. But I think it's better than that Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. in the fact that God is the agent who's initiating all this stuff. It's not like I'm going to God and saying, hey, if I give you my Mm -hmm. sin, will you clean me up and make me a a better person? It's not like that. It's more of a a question of God is the one who initiated Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't in a position to initiate anything. God initiated it by sending Christ on our behalf. And when it says he made him to be sin for us, how do you hear that? (laughs) Because there are a lot of different ways to answer that question, and some of them are a little problematic. Yeah, I mean, he was sinless. And some of these translations make it appear that suddenly he became sinful. And that's a problem. I'm more comfortable with the Martz translation that he read about to became the offering for our sin. Mm-hmm. He's the perfect Lamb of God. Yeah, there and the idea there, I think, is that he put himself in a position where he would bear the full weight and force of our the sin of our humanity. He took it at its worst in all of it. When he didn't, and he overcame it. it. Yeah, he overcame it by using that moment to show us how much God loves us. Yeah, and then he rose from the dead. Yeah, and he you didn't know, to deserve show, it. I yeah, mean, it's just no. that's the power of it. Yeah, I hear a couple of things. One. <laughs> For our sake. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just kind of pause there. Yeah. For our sake. And that says that this is not just a transaction. This is not just, hey, give me the package and go on your way. This is a rescue mission for relationship. Mm -hmm. And when I see made him to be sin, who knew no sin, while it can on first glance look like somehow... Jesus turns into sin Mm -hmm. that I don't see it that way. I see it as the relationship or the disconnect that had to happen on the cross was so profound Mm -hmm. that that sense of separation and agony was as if Jesus was sin. God had to treat him Mm -hmm. as if he was sin in order for us to have that sense of his righteousness. See, and that's really close to what I'm saying too, so that it becomes a revelation of the very nature of God, mm-hmm. who shows us 
what he is willing to bear to forgive us, mm -hmm. to show us his goodness, to show us his love. And the, the end result of it is that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, around this table, we've talked many times about the fact that righteousness is one of those really misunderstood words, really mm. in, in church world. I mean, mm -hmm. we hear the word righteousness even in church world, and we think in terms of moral uprightness, mm -hmm. moral correctness. But the word actually means right standing yeah. or right relationship. So in a sense, what I'm suggesting with this idea of the great transfer is God takes our sin and its consequences and the full weight of that and transfers it to the sinless Lamb of God. And he takes Jesus's right relationship with his Father, mm -hmm. imagine that, mm -hmm. and transfers that to us. Mm. Now, I mean, I don't know about you, but that takes my breath away. Oh, it does. I think that it is almost scandalous to yeah. read. Like, if if this wasn't in the Bible, if someone were to say that, it would yeah. feel like mm -hmm. almost scandalous. Like, like, what? Become yeah. the righteousness of God? Be in right standing with God with all the things that I know that have been a part of the bad decisions, thoughts, intentions of the heart that I've had? Wow, that's yeah. it's mind-blowing. But it is this radical identification of the significance of what Jesus did. It's like, yeah, it is scandalous, but the scandal is this is how much God loves you and this yeah. is how much he's willing to do to be in relationship with you. Yeah, in order to, to make us true to himself by giving us reason to trust him and to love him. I mean, it, it's like God's doing this to show us how much he loves us to draw us into that love for him. Yeah. I can trust the God like that mm -hmm. if I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I need this more concrete and visual. <laughs> okay. And Bill, you know, for our friends who are listening, I'm looking at you and you used your hands to yeah. describe that transference. We've had illustrations of a, a convict in a courtroom who's on the seat, you know, and he's going to be judged. And then Jesus comes in and sits in his place. I mean, we've seen those things. But I actually was, when you were talking about the transference, I was thinking about bank accounts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you, in your mind, can can picture two vertical columns, maybe they're on your phone, maybe they're on your computer, maybe they're just in your mind. But one is like you and the other one's God. Okay. And so can you use that visual and say that sentence again so I can watch in my mind where... Mm -hmm the sin goes and where the yeah. righteousness goes? Yeah, so Jesus, because he's sinless, because he's the perfect son of the Father who always only did those things that pleased his Father, which is huge, is on one side and on the other side is us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So those are the two accounts, mm -hmm. if you will. So mm -hmm. on the cross, what God does is he takes our account of sin and all of its consequences and puts that on Jesus, and he takes Jesus' account of pleasing his Father and being in right standing with him and get, puts that in our account. Does that help any? Yeah, that helps a lot. And so the sin goes to Jesus, which God then commutes, if that's the right word, and the righteousness goes from Jesus to us. Yeah. Would it be right to say, though, that this is probably... Even though we're, we're doing our best to try to describe right, it, right. it, it probably really goes beyond our ability to understand. Totally. Absolutely. Right? And that's totally. one of the reasons why we have 15 atonement theories. <laughs> yeah. Because we're all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to explain it. And we come to different things that make sense to us. Yeah. Right. That might not make sense to you, Elisa, or mm -hmm. you, Russell, or mm -hmm. you, Mark. But this is the one that makes sense to me. Yeah. Second Corinthians 5.21 is the only thing I've found in the New Testament that really gives me any sense of, okay, how does God make this work? Well, mm -hmm. there's this transfer of the stuff of my account. Jesus takes that on himself, and the stuff of his account, God gives to me. And mm. it's profoundly relational. Profoundly mm -hmm. relational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not transactional. That's yeah. why misunderstanding the word righteousness is so important. If, if we understand righteousness as right relationship, now we see what the end game was. Yeah. What God was going for was relationships so that there would come a day when there'd be a whole array of people, thousands of thousands and ten thousands before the throne saying, worthy is the lamb who mm. was slain for he has redeemed us by his blood and caused us to be, and then all of our right standing stuff yeah. comes into play. I think the imagery of our stuff going on Jesus 
also, just real quickly, reflects back to the sacrificial imagery because when sacrifices would be made, the person bringing the sacrifice to cover their sin or whatever, as the sacrifice being slain, actually they would put their hands on the head of that Mm -hmm. animal as if, okay, my stuff's going on to them. And I think that that's the, the same kind of imagery we're seeing here as our stuff goes on to Jesus and his right relationship with the Father becomes our greatest privilege so that we can cry, Abba, Father. Yeah, the great transfer. That's a really helpful way to think about what Jesus did on the cross, bearing the sins of the world and offering us forgiveness. Flipping from a transactional way of thinking about our relationship with God to that transfer model, it makes all the difference. Well, so glad you could join us today on Discover the Word. Your study partners are Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Marty Hahn, and Rasul Berry. And they will pick up this study called Forgiveness, the Story of Easter, with a conversation about what Jesus' number one goal was in coming to earth and how that fits into our discussion of forgiveness and the story of Easter. But first, this word about an Easter resource from Our Daily Bread Ministries that can help make your celebration of Easter more meaningful and intentional this year. Well, Easter is just around the corner, and it's a special time to reflect on what God accomplished on the cross and what it means for your life today. And so to help you in your Easter observance this year, I want to encourage you to check out an Easter reading plan from Our Daily Bread called The Promise of Forgiveness. It meshes really well with the conversations that we're having this week. And what we've done is put together 10 Our Daily Bread type reflections designed to prepare your heart in the days leading up to Easter Sunday. You'll read scripture passages combined with compelling personal stories of forgiveness and reconciliation made possible by the sacrifice of Christ. If you've never used one of our reading plans before, I would especially encourage you to give this one a try. You can read it in your own quiet time, or you can read it together with your spouse or with your family. This year's Easter reading plan will be on the Our Daily Bread app that you can find in your app store. Just look for reading plans in the menu. Or you can also go to the special website for the plan. Go to go.odb.org slash Easter 23. That's go.odb.org and then slash Easter 23. And now back to forgiveness, the story of Easter. Are you into goal setting? And if so, what kind of areas do you set goals in for yourself? I'll give you a second to think. One of my life goals was to break 80 on a golf course, to shoot a round Uh of golf in the 70s. (laughs) And I remember how thoroughly satisfying it was the first time I shot 76 was the first mm-hmm. time I broke 80. Mm-hmm. And it was just this great feeling <laughs> of accomplishing something I've been working toward for 40 years or something. Now my goal is to get a hole in one at some point oh, in my yeah. life. <laughs> okay, you have small goals, okay. I, I don't think of them as goals, but all times I look back and I'll think, you know, I, my effort, my thought today was to get this done. Mm-hmm. And I either got it done or I didn't get it done. Mm-hmm. If I didn't get it done, I feel like, oh, I really fell short. Yeah, it, my, I would look at more of time management is how I look at it. Like, I need to get these three pieces done by Wednesday, or I look ahead of my life and I think I've got these commitments coming up. So that's more how I work. Maybe because my, I'm the age I am, but I have much fewer goals of like life goals of like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds or I'm going to, I'm like, oh, whatever. You know, that's more how I am now. <laughs> For me, it starts and stops. Sometimes I can get locked in and have this great moment where I got a to-do list. And then at that point I am like, I want to accomplish mm-hmm. all these things. Mm-hmm. But then that doesn't <laughs> stay consistent and mm-hmm. I'm just not there all the time. Yeah. Well, we've lived long enough to know that those New Year's resolutions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they kind of turn into New Year's reservations after a while. <laughs> yeah, huh? regrets, right? <laughs> <laughs> Goal orientation can be helpful. It can also be unhealthy. Goals can kind of become almost like idols mm. that demand all of ourselves when maybe they're not really worthy of that. I mean, I can be honest enough to say that breaking 80 on a golf course is maybe not the most important thing you can ever do in life. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Would it surprise you to know that Jesus 
had goals when he came to this earth. Mm. Hmm. And I think he expressed those goals much in the way that we would express a mission statement. Organizations today have Mm. mission statements. This is why we exist. We exist for this, you know. Jesus' mission statement or goal for the incarnation is found in Luke 19, verse 10. Mm. Elisa, would you read that for us? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yeah, I think that kind of talks about his mission. Yeah. And I find that to be very helpful for me because, I mean, obviously, when you read the Gospels, you recognize that there are all kinds of layers and textures to that because there are a lot of other reasons why he came as well. But this is the thing that rises to the top, much like we saw in our first conversation, that which was of first importance Mm -hmm. as Christ died for our sins Mm -hmm. according to scriptures were buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Of all of the things that Jesus came to do, I would suggest that this is at the top of the list. This was goal one. To seek and save that which is lost. And what he practiced during his public ministry in individual cases with people became global on the cross Uh when he died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again the third day. So I want us to think about this aspect of our forgiveness as part of the Easter story. And I want us to do it by looking at a verse in Ephesians 1. And Ephesians 1 contains this huge, massive run-on sentence that goes on for like 10 or 15 verses or something crazy like that. But I want to lift out one phrase from out of the middle of it. And if we could hear it in all the different translations again, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, verse 7. Mark, you want to go first this time? Verse 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Wow, that's That's different. really different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's different than yeah. mine. Yeah. Uh, I'm reading in ESV. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And that's almost verbatim with the NAS. I'm so. very close to mine as well. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Yeah. Now, what the NLT does is it puts the motivation first, Mm -hmm. according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. He is so rich in kindness and grace. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That front loads what God's heart motivation was in doing all of this. Once again, we see the cost, and the cost is Jesus' sacrifice Mm -hmm. for us because it says through his blood. But I want us to, in this conversation, focus on what I think are the two key words here. One is redemption. And the other is forgiveness. Mm. Now, in church speak, we kind of use those terms interchangeably, but they mean different things. And that's why defining our terms can be so important. So when we talk about redeeming something, what are we saying? Because that's the root of redemption. What are Mm -hmm. we saying? Think about that phrase, to buy back, often used, but like... In a very, very basic version, where you go to like Chuck E. Cheese or some place where you got those tickets, yeah, and uh, that get printed out when you get the ski ball or the basketball, and you can redeem those tickets for stuffed animal or mm-hmm. some type of trinket that costs mm-hmm. nothing. You know, laffy taffy, yeah, yeah. candy. <laughs> but you're yeah. redeeming the ticket. You're buying back that thing for what yeah. you. Yeah. have in your possession. Good. And that really is, in this translation that I read, it's captured in the word, he purchased, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, he purchased. And I mean, Rasul, you just did a really good job of unpacking that for a 21st century audience mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. has kids that they take to Chuck E. Cheese. Mm-hmm. Right. What might a first century audience have heard when they heard the word redemption? Is it connected to slavery? Yes. To redeem was to purchase a slave off the slave market and set them free. So be to give money for, right? Yeah. So not be, just to purchase them for your own use. Or no, to, be to part purchase of, them and then set, set them free. free. Think about in the Old Testament, the story of Hosea mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. his wife who went into prostitution and she ends up on the slave market. And even though she has violated their marriage covenant, done all these horrific things, he goes and buys her back mm-hmm. and makes her his wife again, mm-hmm. <laughs> restores mm-hmm. her mm-hmm. to that relationship. And... To me, that's such a vivid picture of God's 
redeeming love. Yeah, us. that's that's much deeper than getting some tickets from a ski ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never could make the ski ball work anyway. So, but when the first century audience would have heard redemption, their mind would have immediately gone to the slave market mm-hmm. because that's where the word was primarily used. Mm-hmm. And redemption is one of the atonement theories we talked about in the first conversation. How does God do it? Well, he buys us back. Okay, well, who does he buy us back from? Mm -hmm. And some say from Satan. Mm -hmm. And the scriptures don't go that far. They don't tell us who we were bought back from. It's just told we were bought back from our condition. At great price. At great, at the greatest of all prices. And so they tell us what we were bought back from, which is sin, which is trespasses. And your version, Mart, was... We were purchased from... Purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Okay, so from sins. Because that's a captivity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at the other word, which is the word forgiveness. What do we hear when we hear that word? Mm. I mean, it's a word that gets used in our culture a lot. Yeah. And I think sometimes misuse. But in a basic sense, I think of not holding somebody to something that they've done anymore. So someone hurt you in some type of way or took something from you and and you're saying, I am not engaging or relating to you anymore as if you are indebted to me. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of related to that redemption thing of Mm -hmm. that financial Mm -hmm. terms. Right. So you're saying there that I will not withhold the relationship from you any longer. My relationship. Not based on sin. And the thing where I want to be careful, because that doesn't mean just because I've forgiven someone that that means that. Like if someone stole something from me, that that means I trust them to the same level that I did before. But it also means that when I see that person, I'm not just seeing you, the thief who did this thing to me. That's helpful. I'm seeing you as a person with whom the ledger has been cleared and I'm interacting with you as if that hadn't happened. Okay. But it allows for consequence. Right. Yeah. But it indicates a relationship that is desired and restored. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting is the word forgive means to carry away. Hmm. And that's kind of what you're describing, where the wrongdoing is in a sense carried away, so it's not a barrier Hmm. to relationship like it could have been without forgiveness. But once again, I think what Paul's doing here is he's once again going back into Jewish sacrificial thinking because on the Day of Atonement, Mm -hmm. they would make the sacrifice and then they would take the blood and apply it to the head of a goat, drive that goat out into the wilderness, carrying away Mm -hmm. the symbolism of the wrongdoings of the people. So they didn't kill the goat? Some say they drove it over a cliff or something Mm -hmm. like that, but they drove it out of the camp and Mm -hmm. it carried away the sins of the people for another year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. There's a sense in which, you know, we get more of a flavor of this in hymns and songs where buried he carried my sins far away, Mm. Uh rising he justified freely forever. Mm. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. You know, we hear that language in song and it makes more sense musically maybe than it does in conversation. But when we put these two ideas together, he not only bought us back from our slavery to sin and set us free. He also took that sin that was the barrier to relationship and carried it away Mm. by the sacrifice of Jesus. So that as the scriptures tell us, it's as far as the East is from Mm. the West, Mm. (laughs) which is pretty amazing. No longer held against us. Yeah, and I think it really shows us the relationship between forgiveness, redemption, and our relationship with God. Like those things are the building blocks Mm -hmm. of how we have that type Mm -hmm. of connection with God. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think Jesus was talking about when he said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Have you ever paid off a debt? Yep. Paid in full? Yep. <laughs> How did that feel? Awesome. Yeah. When we got our student loan debt paid off, I like posted about it online. I was so excited to yeah. just to finally be like, we did it. Yeah. yeah. A separate question. Have you ever had anybody pay off a loan for you? Man, oh, I can tell you. I was living in D.C. and actually we were just in the beginning of our like when my wife and I got married, you know, being aware. That's when you start go, oh, this is what you owe. This is what yeah. I owe. OK. This, this now this got, is what we owe. <laughs> this is what we owe. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so we had a, a collection situation and we were told them that we can pay off this in two payments, you know, because it was a big chunk in what we could afford. Well, they said fine. And so we gave them our account information and they took it all out at the same time. <gasps> And so I wasn't able to pay my rent. 
and I called and they were like, sorry, we can get it back to you in two weeks or something mm-hmm. like that, which would have not helped at all. And a friend of mine, I just was asking for a loan and he said, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. And he covered the entire amount mm-hmm. and allowed us to just have that burden off. And mm-hmm. I just remember it being such a tangible expression of Christ's love for us. Did you feel free or did you feel like you owed him? I felt mostly free because I just knew that we, that burden was lifted. Yeah. But because he made it clear that he actually was like, you will not pay me back for this. Mm-hmm. I felt just incredible sense of gratitude. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, he anticipated the negative feelings that could have right. yeah. become a real weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that is a marvelous picture of God's work in redeeming us, mm-hmm. as we saw in our last conversation, at great price, mm-hmm. yeah. but not wanting us to feel guilty that that's what it costs, but to mm-hmm. be grateful, to have a heart of gratitude to a God who would love us this much and go this far to reach us. Rasul, if you'd said, no, 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 yeah. I got to do this myself, yeah. you know, you'd probably still be in a real pickle, you yeah. know, of a situation. There is that to receive it. It's mm-hmm. humbling. It's God has addressed it, you know, by saying, don't worry about paying it back. But, you know, it's humbling to receive. Mm-hmm. You yeah. have to acknowledge that mm-hmm. you're not in the position to do it yourself. Yeah. 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 I have to overcome that fear of the flesh, which mm-hmm. is, I don't want to be indebted to you. I, I yeah. don't want to be encumbered. When you think about the cost that was paid to redeem us, mm-hmm. How could that ever be repaid? Yeah. And that's what makes gratitude, the word gratitude, we talked a lot about words as we, it's related to the word grace. Mm. Mm. How else do we respond to grace but with gratitude, right? Mm-hmm. That's good. So let's look at Hebrews 9.22 because it's going to talk about the payment that was made to pay our debt that was our sin. Rasul, you want to go first this time? Yep. Indeed. Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Mine's very similar. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And I have, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Very similar. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there and I don't want to get stuck. But in my little feeble mind, I want to know why. Why Mm. is blood necessary to cleanse? Why is it blood that's necessary for forgiveness? And in our world, that is just bizarre. Yeah. You know, it sounds cannibalistic or perverse or something weird. Sounds pagan. Yeah. Pagan? Yeah. Think about the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was dedicated, they took the blood of animals and splashed it all over the tabernacle and then over the people as they agreed to keep the law. Can you imagine cleaning that up? Well, first of all, (laughs) in our world, you couldn't do that Mm -hmm. because blood that's exposed is seen as potentially dangerous. Whereas... In the Old Testament sacrificial system, it was seen as cleansing. Mm. You know, I don't know why that is. I mean, that just it says the scriptures have said, you know, and according to the law and all that kind of stuff. I go back even further to Genesis chapter three, when our first parents disobeyed God and recognized that they were naked because they were exposed by their sin. Okay, what did God do in Mm. response? He took animals and their skins and sewed clothing for them. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of creating something out of thin air, I mean, he could have just created clothes out of of nothing. Sure. But in order to get the skins off those animals, there had to be some bloodshed. Right. And I think of the next chapter over when Cain kills Abel Mm -hmm. in Genesis 4. 10 and it reads and the Lord said what have you done Mm -hmm. the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from Mm -hmm. the ground Mm -hmm. and I think in the law when it talks about an eye for an eye or things like that this sense of harming of rebelling against God and harming or defacing his creation is so intense the only picture that we can grasp to understand the severity of the crime is to actually demonstrate the level of horror almost or the level the of severity. The level of severity is yeah. and damage yeah. it is, you know, in that way. And I think that that's at least something I've thought about when I think about the, the fact that the blood is crying out. Like we think about it mostly because we don't associate sin in our culture necessarily with like harm to individuals or against God in that way. But I think that's a connection that is being made in the law. Yeah, it's really a word picture that in effect is saying what you have done is crying out to me, yeah. right? Because oh, wow. the shedding of blood is sometimes seen as symbolic of death or 
in the Jewish system of sacrifice. And again, like you said, Mart and Elisa, in our culture and in our context, all that sounds barbaric. Mm -hmm. But somehow there is a fundamental reality in the heart and mind of God that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's almost made like an axiomatic statement. Mm. And we hear that and we think, what? And yet that's exactly what Hebrews is telling us. Somehow he bears it. Yeah. He endures what we have done. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, can we just, this is real simplistic, but can we just connect it to life? Without life, without mm. life, there is no forgiveness of sin. A life, Jesus' life. I mean, the blood symbolizes in the very first death, is, if we're saying as the animals to create clothes, the blood crying out is that the life, because, you know, the beauty of creation with our first parents is God breathed life into them, yeah. and then their disobedience, the wages of that is death. Yeah. Is it connected there? Well, I think it could be, and I think part of what you're hinting at in Genesis 3 reaches forward all throughout the Old Testament. I think, I mean, think about the thousands and thousands and thousands of lambs that were sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I read once that on Passover in Jerusalem in the first century, up to a quarter of a million lambs would be slain at Passover. Mm -hmm. That's just in one year. Mm -hmm. Now you take all of that and all of that is ramping us up to the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And the fact that if without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, well, the blood of lambs and goats could not take care of our mm-hmm. sin problem. It could cover it, which is what atonement means. It mm-hmm. means a covering. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean a removal or a carrying away yeah. like forgiveness does. It just means a covering. The blood of bulls and goats and sheep could not do that. The blood of Christ could mm-hmm. in his sacrifice when he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And mm-hmm. I think when we look at the shedding of blood, it's easy for us in our modern culture to kind of try to make it symbolic. But with Jesus, it was very real. Yeah. I mean, it was his literal blood that was being shed. Yeah. I think some of it has to be, he did it, he went that far. He subjected himself to that kind of violence because he was revealing the heart of the Father, yeah. and he was doing it to show how much we are loved, that yeah. the Father and the Son the, would be willing to bear yeah. such mm-hmm. horrific. Yeah, and I think about what you're saying, Mart, in terms of Jesus's words during the Passion events, when he said, if I wanted to, I could call to my mm-hmm. Father, and he would send down legions of angels to yeah. come to my rescue. That's not why I'm here. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm here to take all of this Because this is how much my father and I love you. And I think even though in the modern world all that imagery may be barbaric, if we see it as the ultimate expression of God's love for us. And actually, I have this thread that I pull on that I think part of the reason why it's seen as barbaric is because we're looking at a society that's been developed post the crucifixion and the cross. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the atonement that Jesus accomplished, which cease the need for those practices have become such a normative way of looking at relationship with God that people have almost forgotten that that was once a way that it had to happen. Mm -hmm. But on a very basic level, we talked a little bit in another conversation that Elisa led about the secret service and how there are these times where one of the foundational accepting points of that is that if the president is at risk then you put yourself in the way uh Mm -hmm. you take that bullet on that person's behalf and i think essentially that's what jesus does for us Mm -hmm. you know we needed a mediator we needed somebody to go between Mm -hmm. us and the wrath of god and he did that with his own body and whereas that secret service agent might do it out of duty Mm -hmm. jesus did it out of love what Jesus did for us, paying our debt of sin, a debt that we had zero chance of paying, is beyond our wildest imagination, but certainly worth reflecting on this Easter season of the year. Well, one more part of this conversation to go, and in it, we'll be looking at a statement the Apostle Paul made in his letter to the first century church in Rome that gives us a huge clue as to the why. What was the thing that motivated Jesus? to go to the cross and provide for us forgiveness of sin. That follows this quick preview of what we'll be talking about next week during Holy Week, leading up to Easter here on Discover the Word. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder will once again lead the group 
as we continue our conversations for Easter this year. I want us to see a picture of faith this week out of the scriptures. This is the week leading up to Good Friday where we remember the cross and what our Lord suffered. And of course, that's the place where as followers of Jesus, we have put our faith in him and what he did on our behalf. But I think within the events of the cross, there's one of the greatest pictures of faith Mm. you can find anywhere in the Bible that I think we can learn from. And so who is it that displays this Remarkable faith in Jesus at a time when few others had faith in him. A helpful series of conversations about the rebel next to Jesus. Be here at the table with Bill Crowder, Elisa Morgan, and Marty Hahn for our next study on Discover the Word. And now the conclusion of this discussion about how forgiveness is the story of Easter. Are you familiar with Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages? Mm. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Refer it's, to it often. It's yeah. a good one. The first time I read it, and I've read it several times, but the first time I read it, it gave me so much insight into everything I was doing wrong in pastoral counseling. <laughs> How about in marriage? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, then there's yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Marlene had already made some of that pretty clear to me where I was falling down there. So unpack it. What are the love languages? And do you know... What well, you think yours words is. of yeah. affirmation is mine, and Evans' is act of service. And the trick about love language is you need to love someone in their love language, yeah. Yeah. not your love language. Right. Become bilingual. Yeah, yeah. which is tricky. Yep. Then there's also physical touch. Mm-hmm. Quality and, time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the last one is giving gifts. Yes. Yeah. What if you weren't able to figure it out? Well, you're just not going to be very loved. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing about it is, is that in our marriage, I would say that in our marriage, Marlene had figured mine out before I did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. Because she observes me, mm-hmm. whether she likes it or not, that's mm-hmm. what she has to do. <laughs> and she had figured mine out and I'd figured her out. I remember in the book, Gary gives an illustration of a couple who came for counseling and they'd been married for many years and they came in and said, we got to get a divorce. We got to get out of this marriage. And he said, well, why? And she said, he doesn't love me. And the guy said, are you insane? Of course I love you. I work all day. I come home. I fix dinner. I clean up the dishes. I clean the house. What do you mean I don't love you? And she said, that's not love. If you really loved me, you'd sit on the couch and talk with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay. And you know what's so interesting? You asked us if we've ever heard of the book. And obviously we have. But I remember reading recently of how this book has transcended, crossed mm-hmm. all kinds of yeah. barriers mm-hmm. into society. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not just church people that no. read that. No. no. I read a lot of nonfiction, and I read a lot of secular fiction, too. And I, was, I sent Gary a note because we team taught at a conference a couple of years ago. And I sent him a note because I was reading a book. It's a very popular fiction series, always on the New York Times bestseller list. And the protagonist... And his girlfriend went to a conference to learn their love language. (laughs) (laughs) And they mentioned the book, The Five Love Languages. I just thought, Uh, that is so amazing. You know, mm. it seems like such a simple idea, Mm. but it's universal in its application. Mm -hmm. Yes. It really is. So when John Lennon sang, All You Need Is Love, he was onto something, right? (laughs) But you just got to figure out what love means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been talking this week about some very weighty ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have a little lighthearted moment there together about the love languages. But we've been talking about very weighty stuff about the cross and the resurrection and what it accomplished. And in very tiny little ways, trying to peek into maybe how it worked a little bit. Today, I want us to talk about why it worked. And I think in one of the most profound, dramatic statements the Apostle Paul ever wrote, and that's saying something. Mm -hmm. Once again, in all of our translations, could we hear Romans 5 verse 8? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. ESV. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, mine's so similar. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Yeah. And I don't know which part knocks me out the most. This is how he demonstrates his love or that he did it while we were still sinners or that he did it by having Christ die for us. I mean, all three components to that sentence are just massively important. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like to focus on in this conversation is how the cross and resurrection 
demonstrate God's great love for us Mm. because that's the why behind the what. God didn't make Jesus go to the cross and take on the sins of the world because he was mad at the world. I mean, John chapter 3 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him should be saved. Mm. That sounds a whole lot more like Romans 5, 8. Yeah, it's really, and we use this word here a lot, it's about rescue, not judgment. Mm -hmm. And in the process of rescue, we are released from judgment as we understand it. And I think that's what is so mind boggling to Mm. it. Just so surprising and amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And and it doesn't say that Christ died for us while we were desperately seeking him. No. No. You know, while we were sinners and couldn't even help ourselves. Yeah. I think on the one end, a lot of times our world in modern times, the idea of sin has been diminished so much that that can still seem like excessive. Like, why am I got to die because I mm-hmm. cheated on my taxes or because I mm. lied, you know, yeah. cursed somebody out. But the part that hits me is that we know intrinsically that this question of how do I get right with someone that I have wronged is something that is outside of our ability to fix or change or right? control. Yeah, or that's control. Good. We yeah. know that there's a sense of the hmm. brokenness in our world caused by humans that do things that when you kind of look at it collectively, just we're overwhelmed by headlines. Mm-hmm. So all you have to do is just escalate that up mm-hmm. further to go, okay, now imagine what it means for a holy, perfect God who created all of us mm-hmm. and sees all of us as infinitely valued to observe and experience the type of things cumulatively that we see on a daily basis. And now all of a sudden you can get to a place where you recognize the importance of that God demonstrating his love and that they're also needing to be punishment and payment for sin Mm -hmm. while we're spitting at him Mm -hmm. while while we were unwittingly demanding his death and accusing him of being full of the devil yeah Yeah. i mean it was in that moment that god was showing the fullness of his love yeah Yeah. i go back again to john 3 did not come to condemn the world but that the world through it could be saved. And that's why Paul could say in Romans 8, there is therefore no condemnation for the one who's in Christ Jesus. I mean, I know me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know all of my mess and all of my mm-hmm. stuff, and I know all the things that are condemnation worthy mm-hmm. about me. But no, because God has proven his love by sending Christ to die. And that's that's just the most powerful and amazing thing, I think, in the universe, that God would love us, like you said, Mark, Mm -hmm. even while we were spitting at him, shaking our fists at him, hating him, he loved us. Yeah, left to ourselves, we could very well have been one of the religious leaders Mm -hmm. in that crowd, Mm -hmm. stirring up the mob to say, crucify him, crucify him. Yeah, and to take that again back into Romans chapter 8, we saw in some conversations on another subject, Romans 8 begins with no condemnation, and it ends with no separation from the love of God. Mm -hmm. Ah. What his work has accomplished is that we who were condemned are not only brought near to God, but we can never be separated from his love. Mm -hmm. Mm. His love is that enduring and that powerful. And I think that restoring to our relationship with him, but then it also gives us this incredible framework with which to how to interact with each other Mm -hmm. because we hurt each other all the time. Mm -hmm. We, you know, let each other down. We sin against each other. And then we get the direct line. It's like, as you have been forgiven, so forgive Mm -hmm. as you have been restored. Mm -hmm. So restore. So it really becomes the cohesive glue that anchors us all together. When I think about forgiveness and rescue, you know, we use the word salvation, Mm -hmm. sometimes. And it's another one of those words we need to be careful to define because when you read in the Old Testament and you read the word salvation, it's usually referring to rescue from some temporal situation, whether it's David in a cave Mm -hmm. or Israel in slavery in Egypt or whatever the problem du jour might be. That's what you want rescue from. That's what you want salvation from. But all of those little tiny rescues all Mm -hmm. throughout the Old Testament were all anticipating the great rescue that Mm. would come when Jesus came as a response of the Father's love for us. Mm. And that's one of the things that I think makes the Bible so rich and wonderful. We talk about it a lot on here. It's still just telling one story, and the big story is God loves us. Mm -hmm. 
And he's telling us a story that proves it in so many different levels and on so many different ways. And it's also showing us what love is. Yeah. It's built into it. Yeah. So going back to the conversation about the love languages, it takes a sense of sacrificial awareness to recognize what I need to give to my wife, whose love language is gifts, is different than what I might receive love as if it's words of affirmation like you. Mm -hmm. And so that is the other just incredible asset to being in touch with this love of God. Is it actually, this is how we know what love mm -hmm. is, that God first loves us, yeah. you know. And I'm thinking about how we began this conversation with the five love languages. And if you look at them and think about them, God loved us with every one of them. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, if you think about Jesus' act on the cross, hmm. I mean, just take them through giving gifts, the gift of his son, God so loved the world that he gave. Physical touch is interesting. And we actually, we use it every time we celebrate the crucifixion, his atonement for us mm. on the cross when we celebrate communion. Mm. You know, this is my body. This is my blood. Words of affirmation, all that we have mm -hmm. that he says, he pronounces life and newness over us. Quality time. He gave mm. his son on the planet for a long time, three decades. And then acts of service. Whoa. You yeah. know, the ultimate service in paying the price for our sin himself, paid in full. That's so interesting because I was trying to work up the courage to ask, so does God have a love language? Uh, yeah, yeah, and his love language is Jesus. Yeah. And how do we love him back? In the spectrum of ways. How we love him back is a very personal thing. Since we have different love languages, since we have different periods of our growth in our relationship with God, I think all of us, if we're honest, we love him poorly, but we love him kind of like Peter. Lord, you know I love you. You know my heart. This is all I've got. Mm -hmm. This is the best I can do, you know. Even though I denied you three yeah. times and said I never knew you. That's right. And and sometimes that's how we are too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact that our love sometimes may falter his love never will. A lot of times when I was a pastor, a tragedy would strike a family in the church and they would come and say, I thought God loved me. Mm. If God loved me, how could he let this happen to him? You can't judge God's love on the basis of that. If you want to judge God's love, look at the cross because that's the evidence of his love for us. That's where God speaks love to us through Jesus. And that sounds like a unfair answer, but it's really the right answer if you can help them to understand and embrace that what happens to us in the living of life, good, bad, or indifferent, is not an indication of whether or not God loves us. What Jesus did for us is how God has demonstrated his love for us. That is a great reminder to end our study this time. You want to know how much God loves you? Look at Jesus. You've been listening to the Discover the Word podcast and the conclusion of our in-depth look at forgiveness, the story of Easter. I hope these conversations have helped you gain a deeper appreciation for the incredible gift of forgiveness purchased by the blood of Jesus on the cross. Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Mark Hahn, and Rasul Berry have been your study partners these conversations that we hope were a helpful part of your Easter observance this year. And I hope you'll be able to join us for our next podcast for Easter this year about the rebel next to Jesus. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, that challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now here at Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries, it is our mission to tell the story of Jesus and make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And when you give a financial gift, your donation provides the fuel that's needed to help us accomplish that mission. You can give on our website at discovertheword.org Look for the Donate tab up there at the top of the page at discovertheword.org. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.